Thank you very much for that introduction. Your Excellency, uh, distinguished guests, officials, ladies and gentlemen, a great pleasure for me to be here in the Philippines, here for the second time. I was here back in uh, 2001, at the time the World Bank had a conference on uh, pro-poor growth, and I, I gave a keynote speech to that. Uh, in the talk today, I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, megatrends, globalization, independence management, harmony is a goal, and Asian currency and world money. Uh, the world economy, this is a unique period. Unique period because the year 2007 is the only year, perhaps the first year in global history where all the major economies have been moving together very fast. They've, uh, uh, you have the, um, the North America, Europe, and Japan, and China, those big four economies now. We have to put China into the big four because it's now a three trillion dollar economy. And then four other countries, very big, the biggest of the emerging market countries that are left if we take China out, no longer the BRIC, I think of the BRIM nations, Brazil, Russia, India, and Mexico. And then all the other countries, including the Philippines and, and uh, 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 Thailand and uh, uh, Nigeria, Egypt, and so on. So never before has this happened. Why is that the case? What's going on? Well, this is a, a view of the international system. As I look at it, I look at it as a series of globes or currency areas. And those uh, areas represent perhaps monetary power. Monetary power is more or less proportioned to GDP. The, the central area is the uh, US, the biggest economy in the world, $14 trillion economy. And then the euro area, which is about $11 trillion. Then the yen, the Japanese area, $4.5 trillion. And then China has become the fourth largest in that category, out, taking over from the United Kingdom. And uh, th these are the biggest economies in the world. And uh, what are the drivers that make this uh, all working at this time? Well, uh, we've got globalization, which is, came about as a result of the end of the Cold War. Globalization is a natural state of mankind if it's not split into blocks. And with the breakdown of the, well, you first of all had uh, China entered the globalization group uh, in um, uh, 1978 or 1980, and then uh, the Soviet Union and uh, the uh, uh, former satellites of the Soviet Union entered it in uh, 1990, and that uh, that is made globalization possible. It's also been associated a little bit with the uh, single superpower. Uh, and the system of peace that results from that. The replacement of the balance of terror as it was under the dual system with the single superpower, which has its defects of a different kind, I suppose. Then the IT revolution, which came about uh, is largely as a result of, uh, in my view, a little bit prejudice uh, uh, because of the big tax cuts in the 1980s and the very strong, uh, the, efficient, more efficient American economy as a result of that, and the uh, Silicon Valley IT revolution came out. And this is lowering uh, costs, increasing productivity in every sphere of economic life, in firms, households, institutions, and governments. And it's, even if it's still rapidly expanding, every year we have big new changes in technology, but even if we didn't have any new, new technology, just the deepening of the existing technology in all the countries, and especially in the um, poorer countries, would be an increasing a source of increasing productivity and growth uh, for the world. And that's the. And the fourth thing I want to mention is the rise of China, the new big 800-pound gorilla on the block, or maybe 800-kilogram gorilla on the block. A very big thing, enough to make a big change in the picture. A uh, hundred years ago, uh, and, and the American ambassador to uh, London, the court of St. James, 
was um, asked to give uh, uh, a speech on the greatest fact, what was called by, at Cambridge University, called the greatest fact in modern history, which was, uh, according to what his prescription was, the United States, the rise of the United States. Because 100 years before that, by, by around 1792, the United States was 4 million people. And now by 1906, it had become uh, 105 million people, and the biggest economy in the world by far. And within 10 years, it would be bigger than the next three biggest economies uh, put together. Uh, bigger than Britain, Germany, and France put together. So now China is not quite in the same category as that, but it's still a big, going to have a very big impact on the future of this, uh, the rest of this century. Four challenges to the uh, world economies, adjusting to globalization, absorbing, spreading the IT revolution, fitting China into the world economy and stabilizing currency areas. And the factors then uh, uh, of growth, we've mentioned that. Now, um, I mentioned globalization began after China joined the world economy, and then it became a buzzword after the Cold War War ended. Associated today uh, a little bit with the, it's not used, this term isn't used, the Pax Americana, Pax means, of course, peace, <laughs> uh, and of course, there's a, wars associated with it. But the, so we're in a period of great peace. The post-war period has been a period of comparative peace in the world economy. So unlike the uh, uh, the first part of the uh, of the of the 20th century, now the entire world is now involved in in this in globalization, except to Cuba, North Korea, Myanmar, and maybe. Iran and Venezuela. Globalization is a process that means integration at the world level. It proceeds by openness, the natural state of the world. It's not unique to our age. Globalization has had many dimensions, it has many dimensions in economic integration, political, cultural, social, religious, and military. These are, this is the way I look at on that process of globalization, degrees of it by area and period. And I, uh, I don't, um, don't want to, we're not doing a history lesson. This is uh, uh, the way I look at the world in terms of these categories of integration, globalization. But just look at the last part of it, where at, at least the way by, through my eyes I see high, degrees of integration of, on all these categories together, even in religious integration, because much more than before, because it's not necessarily that we have the same religion, but uh, we know about each other's religion to a level and a degree that would, never was the case before. So each dimension of globalization is achieved to a degree depending on culture, and every, every country has to uh, adapt to it in ways that suit their own peculiarities. It's, uh, uh, we have to make, bear in mind things like cultural diversity. Cultural diversity is something that people want to protect. We don't want globalization and integration to mean homogenization. We don't want the whole world all, all the same. And, um, and cultures will try to keep their own, uh, own dimension of that. But even if we get to an equilibrium degree of globalization, um, it's not going to stay that way because innovation is changing the world all the time. Look back in the past 10 centuries and you get all these industrial revolutions that, that go back from you know, printing press, gunpowder. Every time you get one of these new changes, you and most recently the computer IT revolution, you uh, have, uh, have a, new, a new framework of thinking, a new, a new ballpark, if you like. Uh, computer IT revolution is very important because it's uh, democratic in a way. Uh, if countries, if people have get to a certain level uh, of uh, education where they can access the, uh, use a computer and access the internet, if they can get to that level, they have access to knowledge and technology never before, not dreamed of before. Just go back a hundred years, go back even 
25 years, and knowledge and technology is very expensive, and this cheapens a very important part of factors of production. Well, anyway, countries have to decide how far they're going to go and, and, uh, and, and see which way they have to, uh, have to stop and, and so on. Remembering these different societies, cultural diversity, different societies, religions, geographies have different needs. Difficulties, inland states are very different from border states, uh, island states like, uh, like the Philippines and so on, with then, then, then uh, countries that uh, are, are inside access to transport. Think of a country like Mongolia inside, Nepal inside, uh, how much transportation and, and political uh, 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 compromises with its neighbors are an important part in order to just access and get into globalization. So per capita incomes are affected very much by geographical situations. Now, globalization means interaction and in, in, inter, um, um, interdependence. Uh, we're on in, in each other. Globalization means integration with neighbors, and that means independence. Different types of independence you get. You get interdependence through trade, and that's important. And then you get interdependence through even more through changes in factors of production immigration and uh, emigration and capital movements and, and the international monetary state. But the fundamental goal of interdependence management uh, may require an institution uh, because you don't want uh, interdependence management normally in a, with many, many sovereign entities can't typically be bilateral. It's not efficient to have bilateral agreements. First of all, <clears throat> because of big and small countries. There's an asymmetry between big and small countries. You can't leave things out uh, uh, with that. So you need rules 